Hi, Diane. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, listen, I think I have a couple of questions. One, how do you deal with the patient who really, really needs a surgical neck lift, but declines one? They walk in the door and say, hey, this is what I really need. And they start pulling their face up. But then the next breath, they say, I don't want a neck lift. How do you deal with that? That's a very, very good question, Diane. I, I, I tell them that uh, when I look at you, I can see your entire face and neck. I look at you from here to here. And that if I was just to work from here to here, you would look like patchwork. You would come back in three months and tell me you wish you did this. In the same breath, I tell them, uh, I'm not gonna talk you into anything or talk you out of anything but I try without pushing to convince them that that's the best option. Uh, I have yet to tell a patient, no, I'm not gonna operate on you unless you let me touch your neck. But I like to think that showing them photographs, showing them published works that I can convince them that it's their best interest. The other area that I'm having some difficulty is when I suggest that I'm gonna work on the submandibular gland, I don't get any pushback on the uh, digastric or fat deep to your muscle. But when I talk about the salivary gland and I show them where it is, someone has been on the internet, has read that this is dangerous, that this can rot your teeth, you could bleed and lose your life. So I don't push them there. If, if, they, if they or someone in their family or friend has said, you know, you'll die, you'll bleed, I'll tell them, you know what, you're gonna get a substandard result, but I respect your views. These are my numbers. I've never had anybody, anybody bleed. But the, the answer to your question is, I try to convince them that they don't want to look like patchwork, that only working from here up is not going to rejuvenate them or make them feel good about themselves. That's really helpful. And my second question is, and I'm sure <clears throat> that you get this a lot, what do you tell the patient who comes in for consultation and says, you know, I work from home, I'm on Zoom every day. I wanna look better on Zoom. It's painful to see what I look like on the camera but I have over, only over the weekend to recover. So you're probably not going to take a fully surgical approach. Is there anything that you have for a weekend recovery? It, it depends on, on their changes. Uh, you know, I have some limited experience with, uh, with uh, face tight. I have some limited experience with uh, Kybella. I have extensive experience with liposuction of the neck. Uh, I personally have tried and my patients have tried the various creams and I tell them that you, you're going to be, you will be disappointed with anything short of full surgical. Uh, I also tell them that with, uh, with TXA, with the fact that I exclusively use the uh, Colorado tip to dissect in the neck, monitoring their blood pressure intra-op and post-op, that they're unlikely to have excessive bruising, but no promises. So I'll go over the options and also for each option, tell them what result to expect. For example, Kybella, <clears throat> you won't see the result for three months. Liposuction, you won't see it for two or three weeks. Uh, I have very limited experience with cool sculpting of the neck, but I've seen photographs in published papers. And again, that takes three months. So I think for the person who wants to recover in three or four days, I have very little to offer them. And I always tell them, why don't we do something that in the long run is gonna be more cost effective in the long run, it's going to give you a much better and longer lasting result. And that's called surgery, but the recovery may take up to 10 to 12 days. Thank you. Uh, Foad, can I ask a question? 
Absolutely good to see you. I, I love that background behind you. Oh, it's like that every day. <laughs> I know, don't tell me. So um, I was wondering about, could you give a little bit more detail on the anesthetic techniques that are used, whether you're using transdynamic acid, how you're controlling blood pressure, some practical tips, um, because the length of surgery that uh, when we're doing deep neck surgery and certainly the number of planes we're opening, uh, there is a, a worry about hematoma. And could you tell us uh, you know, some of the techniques that you've utilized over the years and the transanabic acid is very popular now and, and give us a little few tips on that. Absolutely. Well, I, I early in my career, I tried uh, facelifts under local anesthetic and I felt uncomfortable being the anesthetist, being the surgeon, monitoring their blood pressure. And I tell all our fellows that what changed my mind was operating on the left side of a gentleman's face while he developed a hematoma on the other side. So I do all of it under general anesthetic. I am friends with the anesthesiologist and anesthetist. I tell them that we need steady blood pressure no rise when they wake up. Uh, I'm relatively new to TXA, probably 18 months or so. Uh, does that help me intra-op? Well, I've always used xylokine and epi. The, the, the change that I have seen with TXA is less, less bruising. I do use the Colorado tip. I'm very, very meticulous about <clears throat> hemostasis. And I follow the patient to the recovery room. Uh, my two favorite drugs and my best friend when I do a facelift is clonidine. I put all my patients on clonidine. <laughs> 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 and, uh, to keep their blood down and keep them, keeping them overnight, not only for observation, but also for monitoring them for nausea, for anxiety, and for blood pressure. I have kept my uh, hematoma rate as close to zero as I can get it. Uh, I know Andre and Lewis are both on this call. Uh, their innovation with the net, I think that's one other area that has been a, a great asset in terms of uh, minimizing the risk of postoperative uh, hematoma. But in my hands, it's anesthetic management, intraoperative management, and most important of all in the recovery room. As you know, most hematomas are within the 12, 24 hours following the procedure. And uh, we keep them all in an overnight facility and the nurses know exactly where I want that blood pressure to be. Since nobody's asking a question, I'll ask another one. The, can, uh, you can hear me okay? Absolutely, I can see you uh, okay, clear good. enough. Okay, good. Um, in the, you haven't mentioned one structure that sometimes comes up. The upper, I'm sorry, the upper neck, and that's a large parotid gland, which is sort of upsetting the definition also of the sternomastoid muscle. And um, comment on, it's not that common, but we, we actually come across this occasionally. How would you manage a patient with a large parotid glands? Uh, how would you investigate and manage that to get the optimal, especially in the male? Very, very good question. I'll have to tell you today, the option would be neuromodulator versus surgical superficial lobectomy. Uh, I think those of us of your vintage and mine who during our training, so numerous parotidectomies have no issue with shaving the parotid gland, which is what I've done, but I, do I do it regularly? No. Do I do it once a month, no, maybe not even once a year, but as needed. Uh, that's a very safe procedure. And I usually, in management of the SMAS, the, 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 the three reasons why I would incise and mobilize the SMAS would be if it wasn't mobile enough just for plication. Number two would be if I need to do any alteration deep to the SMAS, 
most of the time that alteration is working on the buccal fat pad, resuspending or excising, and very rarely, maybe once every two or three years, sh uh, shaving the parotid. You've mentioned neuromodulation. What's your experience with neuromodulation of the submandibular gland? Uh, I've had very limited experience. Uh, both have been in post-op patients of mine who were disappointed that they still had a little bulge there. And uh, I've injected both of them. I was very pleased with the injection. Uh, and uh, to my surprise, and this is true about large muscles like the masseter that I've injected, definitely the parotid and the submandibular gland, the neuromodulator seems to last much, much longer than it does when Andrew injects my corrugators or frontalis. Okay, well, that's a good experience. But I have not uh, had any takers to 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 inject them inject them pre-op and I'm uh, and I'm wondering whether there'd be any advantage if we know we're going to go deep and resect the submandibular gland is anything gained by pre-op injection so that's a question for you for Andre Lewis and Oscar it would be good to get their opinion if they are if they can unmute Okay, um, this is Oscar. Can you hear me? Can Absolutely. I, I can see you and I can see that beautiful tree behind you. <laughs> this is digital. I'm in the OR now. <laughs> um, the, my, well, some comments in relation to the Botox. Uh, I haven't had the need to use Botox uh, for, for control of the uh, perhaps sialoma. You know, I haven't have been doing a deep cervicoplasty with salivary gland resection since the early 90s. And I haven't had any single case of sialoma. Um, we can go in details of what I do to prevent that, but um, I haven't had the need to use uh, Botox. Um, and I believe some of the residual bulge of the salivary gland after the primary surgery is uh, related perhaps to your conservative approach in trying to remove the uh, partial uh, salivary gland. Uh, because if you have a component of ptosis uh, to the salivary gland, still even if you resect the superficial lobe, it still is gonna tend to um, become toric after the surgery. So that's, the situation in which you see some of the residuals, which I have had in myself. So I try to, in addition to resecting the superficial lobe, I uh, try to um, also suspend it uh, to prevent that secondary um, bulging. Um, and uh, I don't want to make uh, too many comments because this is not my, uh, my webinar, it's yours. And I had a question for you. How do you address the patient with uh, the different problems in the deep neck uh, um, in terms of your consent uh, and discussion preoperatively? Is it something that you um, do it after you open the superficial uh, uh, compartment uh, and then make a decision what to do with the deep compartment and, uh, um, and what do you do next? Uh Thank you, Oscar. M most of the time during the initial consultation and examination, I, I have a good idea that I am going to open, do an anterior incision in this neck, that I am going to work deep to the platysma. If I'm sure I'm going to work on the submandibular gland, I'll add an extra 15 to 20 minutes to the operating time so I can take my time and not be rushed with the gland. Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes intraoperatively, I may change my mind. If I had misjudged that there was more subplatysmal sub fat or that the digastric was more of an issue that I could see pre-op, then I will still do the deep work first. 
when I'm done with that, I will stretch the neck, flex the neck, uh, even stretch the skin a little to see if I'm happy. If I'm happy, we're done. If I'm not happy, then I use the wall suction with a flat cannula and do some very limited open liposuction of that skin, uh, skin flap superficial to the platysma. But I never start a case that I know I'm going to go deep to the platysma. I never started by doing superficial liposuction. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, some of the problems that we see uh, after cervical plastic uh, counter irregularities, uh, fusions, um, et cetera, et cetera, are related to much superficial fat resection. And I've been uh, saying for many years, you should leave at least uh, one centimeter or at least half centimeter of fat underneath the, the, the skin. And this goes for all type of uh, liposuctions everywhere because the um, production of um, the collagen depends on the fatty acids of the underlying, underlying fat. So if you resect too much fat, there won't be no fatty acids to help produce collagen. And that's why thin patients exposed to sun, they look terrible. And uh, uh, chubby, chubby uh, bodies and faces exposed to the sun, they don't look that bad. Uh, because I guess the collagen uh, production is uh, different. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And one of, the, one of the slides that I love to show to trainees and even some of my lectures and teaching courses is that oversuction in the superficial plane to try to improve on deep plane problems results in disasters of skin adhesion, adhesion to the platysma. So your point is very well taken. Dr. Nohei, this is Luis Alvarez from Brazil. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Congratulations, uh, Andrew, you. And, and for your talk too. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, as we progress and we master the upper, uh, low, uh, the upper level of the uh, deep neck, we encounter some problems with the lower part of the neck. And I would like to know from you, what is your approach for skin flexibility and fat accumulation in the lower part of the neck, especially that part close to the clavicle and the sternum? Uh, when I see a patient and I talk to them about platysma bands, I also tell them, you know, you have these bands that go across this way. I've had limited experience with uh, putting filler in those, uh, those uh, lines or fat. When I see that, I like to do extensive, uh, very extensive undermining and some, again, once everything is contoured, once the undermining is done before we resect <coughs> the excess skin, I'll do some limited open liposuction, not with a strong machine, but just with the, uh, with the suction that's available in the operating room. Uh, I know that Bam. you and Andre are doing some uh, innovative and new work on the uh, lower muscles, but I have uh, I've not tried that yet. Dr. Nahai, I, I, you said you had some limited experience with face type. And I do a fair amount of it. So I'd want to know what your indications for using that would be. My indications would be the primarily someone I've already done a facelift on. They're not happy. And maybe I should have removed a little more, uh, a little more fat from them. I find that a better option than going back and doing uh, liposuction. Uh, primary patients where... I feel that if I were just to do superficial uh, liposuction in the superficial plane, that I would still have a little excess skin. Then I would say that uh, uh, face tight is a better option because there is more effective skin tightening as well as removal of the excess fat. Uh, 
my son who's teaching me how to get good at this has much more experience with it than I do. And I know those are his indications. Thanks very much. Part. Sorry. I have another question for you regarding the uh, digastrics. Uh, do you usually apply Kate and digastrics? And, and if you do, uh, when do you indicate that for, for a specific patient? Well, maybe I should ask Andrew to answer that question because the last neck lift we did together and he was doing the uh, platysma application in the midline, I saw that the digastrics were a little full, a little too far out. And I said, when you're grabbing the platysma, go down, put a, take a bite of the digastric on each side and uh, bring it together. So uh, if, I see, if, if I'm not able to bring the uh, platysma together and I'm trying to decide whether to excise the digastric or to plicate it, uh, I will try to assess the thickness and if it isn't too thick, I will placate it in the midline. Uh, there's a dearth of information on that in our literature. The uh, last paper that I saw was uh, it, from a facial plastic surgeon in, uh, in Memphis who's published on just doing digastric plication and he showed some very good results in the neck. Uh, coming back to your question about the lower neck, uh, I've never done a direct excision, but I know a uh, facial plastic surgeon in uh, Los Angeles, I've seen him present at the uh, Las Vegas meeting, direct excision with some very, very, uh, very uh, impressive results, but I, I, I have not done that. When you placate, uh, do you see that the, uh, the angle, the, the, the new angle that you obtain would be a consequence of a reposition of the uh, hyoid or just the uh, soft tissues that are surrounding it? We have a question. I mean, this, uh, this is something that uh, we've discussed uh, during our surgeries that we wonder if the uh, hyoid is really repositioned. I mean, in terms of uh, skeletal repositioning of it. Uh, I've, do you done think it I've, I've done it both ways with and without the uh, fascia release. And I think in most of my patients, my patients don't have the very heavy necks that I know you have in Kurachiba. Uh, my patients have a little bit of a, an angle there to begin with. So most of the time I rely on the platysma to do that. If I'm not happy, Yes, I'll go ahead and, and, and release the fascia and try to reposition the hyoid. Uh, but, uh, let me ask you again, do you think that the, the hyoid is really repositioned? Do you believe that it, it has a difference when in pre and post-operative position of the hyoid in relation to the other? Is, uh, I thought, um, I, seen, I thought I had seen some pre and post op radiological images from your practice that shows it's a reposition. So you've convinced me that we are repositioning it. Okay. Well, we still have that question in mind. <laughs> no, no, I've seen I've seen I've seen your work. I've seen the radiographic evidence that we are repositioning it. I got a question. Sorry, oh, sorry, Roscoe. Uh, Oscar, you might have the same kind of patients, but our patients are very sunburnt, as we mentioned, there's been reference to that. What, and uh, I noticed, uh, Foed, that part of your uh, signature is micro, is it microderm or what part of your logo there? What sort of skin rejuvenation techniques are used by your clinic in trying to improve the quality of that skin when it is sunburnt, wrinkled and um, hyperpigmented? Are you using RF, uh, Althera, Microfat? Give us an idea about some of the strategies you can use to improve the quality of skin beyond the surgical technique. It's a very good question. I, I rely on chemical peels. Um, my routine is to do a 20% <coughs> TCA peel 
regardless of how much I've undermined the neck, I have absolutely no concerns uh, of the safety of doing a peel. I'll start the neck and go down to the decollete area. I believe that 0.1% uh, croton oil would be equally as safe, but I have not tried that. Uh, on the face, I have no issues with the brow, with the mid face, but I have shied away from any kind of resurfacing over the flaps that I have, uh, I have undermined. Uh, the work of uh, Alex Vapal and Patrick Tonard and some of the work that Steve Cohen has done about uh, taking the uh, nano fat or, su or super nano fat and uh, needling it in there. Uh, I haven't done enough to say to, 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 to say that it's my routine, but I've seen their fabulous results. So I think for most of us, at least for me, the peel is what I do, and on a few occasions, I've tried that uh, micro needling of that uh, nano paste. That you put the paste on, and then you needle it in. Okay. Thank you. Um, I got a question for you, Fuad, and perhaps for the rest of the panel. Uh, one of the things that we discuss constantly in our um, chat rooms is about doing a um, partial section of the gastric application. And this is a problem that I see that if you're going to do partial resection, I think you're committed to do partial resection. You cannot plicate it because the muscle fibers doesn't have the fascia anymore and doesn't hold anything. So uh, what's your comment on this? I, I couldn't agree with you more. You can't, you can't do a partial excision and then try to, uh, try to uh, placate it. Uh, if I feel it's the bulk of the digastric that's contributing to the volume of the neck, volume of the submental triangle, then the best option is excision. But if I feel bringing the digastrics together is going to more clearly define the submental area for me, that's when I would do the plication. So uh, to me, it has to do with the volume of the, of the muscle. Well, thanks. I thought it was just my technique that I couldn't do it. <laughs> I appreciate you both. <laughs> Well, uh, this is Andre. Hi, uh, congratulations, Andrew. Hello, Andre. Uh, thanks, thanks for uh, being with you. Hi, Dario. Hi, Fuad. Good morning. Hi, Oscar. Good morning. And the others that I'm meeting now. It's congratulations for this beautiful panel. Uh, as far as what uh, Oscar is saying, uh, we do uh, in most of our, of our patient. Uh, at, at least part of our patient resection of the uh, medial aspect of the digastric and, and we still are able to placate. I think that the secret to do this placation is that you have to start with the first suture close to the tendon or on the tendon. And then from that suture going to the chin with a continuous running suture of course, if you take too much of the, um, uh, of the digastric belly, you're going to have difficulties to find tissues to be um, uh, sutured together. So I think we, we can do that. I know, Oscar, you, you are a very experienced surgeon, Dr. Fouad Nahai as well. But we, uh, we are doing this type of uh, combination uh, the uh, res partial resection and suture. And we believe in our perception that with this ligature, we can elevate the mylohyoid. So uh, consequently, we elevate the base of the tongue, which is uh, very important to flat the submental area in the postoperative period, especially when the patient bends the, uh, the head down. Technique. Yeah, it will be interesting to see, uh, to get a post-operative uh, MRI to see if that sutures is still 
uh, holds there and the possession of the the gas so you are advanced after technique combined technique you're describing yeah yeah we I, i'm not sure i'll have mris we can see it clinically and uh, we see it very efficient, you know, in some patients that we didn't do the uh, digastric plication, we had to go over and, you know, put a suture, uh, remove, resect the digastric and put a suture to elevate the, uh, we consider this the most important part of the neck lift, although some will be, um, uh, think differently uh, from what we do. We think the, that the uh, digastric shaving and plicature, one of the most important steps of this uh, surgery. And we are going beyond, we are going beyond the hyoid. We're going to the sternohyoid muscle because we feel so confident and so pleased with this uh, digastric plicature that we're continuing this suture down to the uh, sternal notch. Someone is sharing the screen. Uh, yeah, uh, I think the actors are, sh are pr probably demonstrating your questions, doctor, as well. They were just, you send them a, a picture of your question. I think they uh -huh. maybe have you demonstrate this question. <laughs> Do you use this yeah. one? Yeah, this is one of the questions that I sent to Dr. Andrew and Dr. Fouad Nahai. And uh, the lower neck, uh, which is the, uh, when it, we, we talk about digastric and submandibular salivary gland, we're talking about the horizontal neck, but there, the vertical neck is something that is not commonly discussed in the panel. And it's really very important, especially mainly in short necks and poor uh, skeletal frames and large tongues. These patients come to our, uh, to our office uh, to, for improvement. And those are the most difficult case, you no know, short, short necks, poor skeletal frame, frames and bulky uh, tongues. These are really the challenging patients. When we discuss patients, slim necks, long necks, you know, small submandibular salivary glands, uh, bulges, those are relatively relatively simple to deal with. But short necks, poor skeletal frame, and bulky uh, tongues are really uh, challenging. I don't know what are your opinion about this. But we, see, we see this patient quite frequently in our uh, office. Uh, well, you're the one who's doing the pioneering work on this. You're the one who's convinced us that uh, supporting the floor of the mouth will provide a much more long lasting result in the submental area. Uh, I don't think the patients that I see and I operate on and the ones that we put in this uh, paper are the kind that you're working on, but I'm following your work very with a, with a lot of interest, especially the work that you're doing lower in the neck, uh, lower in the neck, because most of my patients, the work that I do in upper and mid neck usually takes care of the lower neck. But I, I like your thinking, you, you're, you're being very innovative with this. And when I see a patient that I feel is similar to the ones that you're treating on a daily basis, I would be tempted to try it. But I like your concept of supporting the floor of the mouth to hold up the contour of the submental area. Yeah, th that's very interesting, Dr. Fouad. I think uh, this has made a lot of uh, improvement in the quality of our result, long-term result. I mean, not short-term. The thing is that short-term, you can get very good results 
placating the platysma. But when you go in the long run, uh, the subplatysmal uh, plicatures and, um, and the, all these changes that are necessary, as Andrew mentioned before, they, they will make difference in the long term results. I, uh, congratulations, beautiful presentation, Andrew. You really did a great job. I think if we're done, all that remains would be for me to add my thanks to Andrew who worked very hard on this, uh, yeah. on this paper. My thanks to all of you for joining us this morning and- uh, thank, thank you, Professor Nahai. I, I guess uh, Professor Yang, he may have the question. Professor Yang, do you have a question to propose? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Daping Yang from Beijing. Uh, I, uh, in my practice, uh, I performed the uh, facelift procedure over uh, 1026 with a different technique for the relatively young patient. Their average age is 14 years old. And, but there are only less 10% cases who underwent both face and the neck leave the procedure in my hand. So uh, the reason why is uh, so uh, limited experience because I think there are some uh, difference between Chinese and the Western patient about the neck anatomy. So uh, I think the pre uh, platysma band is not common in Chinese women because there are less central scepter uh, with uh, scepter uh, rupture on the platysma. What do you think, Dr. Nahai? Do you have any comments? Well, I'm very glad that you brought this up because I couldn't agree with you more that there are there are significant differences and the same operations are not going to work. Uh, from my reading, I am very familiar with the fact that uh, a lot of plastic surgeons in China will do a skin lift on Chinese women rather than doing any, uh, sub, any SMAS work. And I've seen that the results are good. Uh, despite the fact that I read a lot of papers that come from China on aesthetic surgery of the face and neck, I must say, until you mentioned it, I had not noticed that the pre-op patients do not have as do not have the platysma bands the way most of our patients in the West do. Okay, uh, we have limited uh, experience with the uh, neck lift because uh, we routinely perform the mental uh, supplemental liposuction and tightening the neck skin in most of our patients. However, we did not pay more attention on the other anatomical problems such as a large uh, submandibular gland and uh, the gastric muscle. So uh, uh, would you like to uh, uh, tell us how to identify submandibular gland ptosis or uh, hypertrophy? Well, I think that we can see that preoperatively when we evaluate the patient for a face and neck lift. and. What I'm hearing from you is that you don't see those changes or those that, or that morphology in, in the patients that you operate on. And that's an excellent point to make that there are differences. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nahai. Thank you. And next I time I read a paper on uh, facial rejuvenation in uh, 
Chinese and Asian women I'll pay more attention in seeing what the pre-op next looked like. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Nahai.